So I want to take us back right now. Uh, all books of history are time travel. All books of history are time travel. And this moment, we're going to go back into the 19th century. And we know lately some people have been talking about Andrew Jackson. Our president has been talking about bloody Andrew Jackson. And we know that in 1827, the Indian Removal Act removed the five civilized tribes from the American Southeast. Uh, among them, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Choctaw, the Seminoles, who were the last to be dragged out and go. And we know on the books of the Trail of Tears, you know that expression, that the Cherokees walked out of the Southeast to Indian Territory in Oklahoma. Many died, you know, froze, died of disease, died in childbirth, as we, the United States of America, appropriated their lands and sent them to what was then kind of the wilderness. Uh, when I, looking at this book and reading, I had not uh, accounted in my mind for the other tribes and ethnic groups of Native Americans who are in the Northwest. Uh, I had not accounted for them in my mind because as an American, I grew up in Virginia, I'm sort of Eastern centric, right? Daniel takes us to the time of one of the most fabled characters in Native American Northwestern history, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce, who himself, the Nez Perce figure in American history, the great, some great events in American history, when Lewis and Clark had been sent by Jefferson to travel to find a, a path through the west to the ocean, um, they were starving in coal when the Nez Perce found them and showed them the way. So, so they are uh, you know, a dominant force in the Northwest, in Washington and Idaho. And they remained somewhat free for a longer period of time. But eventually, the US government came to confiscate their lands and send them to, to reservations in Indian Territory. This book is the saga of Joseph, Chief Joseph, who's a person who doesn't speak English, by the way, um, but a person of great magnetism and great sense of self and self-possession. And his adversary from the federal government is a one-armed general, last name of Howard. Howard has been a fighter in the Civil War. After the Civil War, he serves as director of the Freedmen's Bureau, which was for, essentially for the resettlement of former slaves. And they are brought together in a conflict because Howard is sent out of Washington to apprehend Joseph and the Nez Perce to take the remainder of their territory and send them to, to reservation. This is sort of one of the, a kind of a little tone, little told, but epic struggle in this period of time where there's also war, right? But also a lot of diplomacy on the part of Joseph, who manages um, belatedly to get something out of the government, which is amazing because he didn't really speak English. Um, so tell me, tell us how was Joseph able First of all, give us your sense of Joseph, how you came to this book, and how was he able to get this sense of self-possession to do what he was doing? So, it's a great question. You know, I, I think that, uh, you know, Joseph was someone who, uh, when settlers started encroaching on his ancestral territory in the early 1870s, he was about 30, a uh, fairly young man, and he was someone, power in, in, uh, among the Nez Perses was fairly widely dispersed. Uh, so he was someone who was uh, far outranked by 
people who uh, had long experience hunting buffalo uh, uh, east of the Bitterroot Mountains, uh, fighting rival tribes uh, to the east, the, the Blackfeet, the Lakota, the Crow. Uh, and uh, so he was someone who uh, took it upon himself to reach out and, and try to change federal policy uh, mm -hmm. when he heard that his land had been put into the public domain. And it, you know, in a way, he and his brother Olicott were, were kind of a, a solo operation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, what's amazing is it, you know, there, there were plenty of leaders who uh, laid low or, or retreated into the mountains and, and did not engage with the federal government. Uh, but Joseph took it upon himself to uh, find any federal official he could. Uh, and you know, it's speaking in the regional trade language called Chinook jargon, uh, he would make his case. You know, and it, you know, out, uh, his ancestral territory was the Wallawa Valley, which is the far northeastern corner of Oregon. It's where Oregon, Idaho, and Washington meet. And it was incredibly remote. And you know, to find the federal government uh, takes some effort. You know, there was the Indian agent to the Nez Perce tribe, which was uh, uh, based about 100 miles away, Lapway, Idaho. Uh, and then he found uh, a regional supervisor for Indian affairs. He, he found uh, a congressman who was home from recess. And he would go out and uh, uh, make his case to them. And every time uh, they heard him, they would say the same thing, which is, uh, you know, what do you expect me to do? I'm just one guy uh, 2,500 miles from Washington. I have no power to change anything. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Joseph had a remarkable way of, of uh, compelling people's attention. Uh, so for one thing, you know, trying to think about what made him so charismatic, uh, even when he was just speaking in translation, essentially. Um, it, for one thing, he was tall. Uh, so late 19th century, uh, uh, you know, people uh, existed at lower altitudes, uh, and he was over six feet tall. Um, like Jefferson. And, and writing, um, uh, Oliver Otis Howard, for example, uh, you, you know, is someone who, uh, you, you know, my, my measure, uh, uh, he, he's shorter than I am. Um, and so he was someone who, uh, he was tall, he was big, he filled the room, and then lots And he was very handsome. Right. And, and he had a way of, of uh, uh, holding a room. Uh, you, you know, he was someone who, um, uh, you know, if, if you've ever read the, the novel Primary Colors, you know, there's the description of the Bill Clinton-like character and how he would shake hands. And Joseph was like this. He wouldn't just shake a hand. He would clutch a hand and hold it, and he would look deep into people's eyes. And, and Definitely Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when Howard met him, um, uh, he... You know, he described their first meeting and said that uh, Joseph looked into my eyes and uh, he looked into my soul and at the same time revealed his own motives in turn. You know, it was, it was this confident move uh, and at the same time uh, it, it projected some kind of you know, irresistible vulnerability. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in a way, I, I think... You know, people would listen to him, and he spoke a language of, of uh, you know, I think it was rooted in treaty rights, but also in the decades of trade that his people had engaged in uh, when he talked about, you know, this isn't fair. Uh, you know, he said that the, there, there was another group of Nez Perce bands who were, you know, 100 miles away who had signed away his own land when his band had not been represented at this treaty council in 1863. The way Joseph explained it was, it's like if the government came to me and said, Joseph, we want to buy your horses, and I say no. So they came, so instead they go to my neighbor and they say, we'd really like to buy Joseph's horses. And, and my neighbor says, sure, I'll sell you Joseph's horses. You know, here we are in Brooklyn. It's like selling you the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and then the, uh, then the government uh, would pay my neighbor, come back to me and say, 
uh, well, we bought your horses, right? And he spoke this language that everybody could identify with. And, it, you know, it's a language of, it, you know, it's rooted in sovereignty, you know, in, in his, uh, uh, his people's status as a sovereign nation. But at the same time, it kind of blurred the line. It blurred into rights, you know, br blurred into talk about liberty and equality. And, it, you know, I think it's something that a lot of people identified with. It seemed like he was making this very, uh, uh, you know, a claim for fairness that people could understand. Uh, and it's something that Oliver Otis Howard, as the, the former commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau, um, also would have recognized, because this was language that, that he had pioneered during Reconstruction. What is, let's, no, so we have Joseph, right? And just quickly, what's the lineage of the Nets Purse? What is their relationship to the other tribes that we might recognize? Or are they a, dist, were they a distinct entity? Oh, they're, they're, were they related in the Lakota at all or no? No, um, so, so they're a, um, uh, a, a Columbia Plateau tribe. Got it. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, as they, you know, after they got horses um, uh, in the, uh, uh, 18th, early 19th century, they, they began crossing the Bitterroot Mountains and, you know, forged all kinds of relationships with tribes uh, mm -hmm. uh, like the Bitterroot Salish, the Flatheads. Um, but, but really, um, uh, you know, and, and they had close ties to uh, different Columbia Plateau tribes too. You know, Umatilla, Yakima. So basically, so we have this charismatic Josephs, about my height, um, and we have this shortish general um, who is himself kind of a, a refugee from the Civil War and a refugee from the failed project of freedom. Uh, if you read my essays in New York Times from time to time, I often refer to Reconstruction uh, because I have uh, a little commercial from my own work. And I often talk about how the debate we're having about voting rights, contemporary now, contemporary in America, is a replay of what happened in Reconstruction. Slavery is over, 13th, 14th Amendments pass, um, and suddenly slave owners see human beings that they formerly owned standing in line at the polls to vote. And they are appalled by that. And they are outraged by that because, in fact, they have uh, adjudged blackness to be a state of second class subhumanness. And this is only, this is proximate to what we're seeing now and uh, limitations of voting rights across the United States. So, Mr. Howard is a person who has seen this experience and who part of his duty after the war was to try to adju adjudicate fairness for for formerly enslaved people. So how, what is the thinking of General Howard as he traverses America to go and take the land of Joseph on the Nez Perce? And when we think about Howard during Reconstruction, I, I think it, it um, to me, I go back to a question that the historian Leon Litwack identified as central to the moment of emancipation, which was how free is free? You know, liberty and equality, they were you know, boldly pronounced by the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th and 14th Amendments, but they were never precisely defined. You know, these were concepts that had to gain meaning in practice. And Howard was, a, you know, as, as the head of you know, the first big federal social welfare agency in American history. You know, his job was to give meaning, you know, practical meaning to, to liberty and equality and was just central to that project. And, you know, for him, uh, he had poured so much into Reconstruction. You know, he viewed it as, you know, his role in the Freedmen's Bureau as, as God's providence. You know, this was going to be the cause of his life. You know, he was 34 when the Civil War was ending, and he was wondering, like many 
soldiers do, whether his best years were behind him. And then he was offered the, the commissionership. Uh, and it was like, he, I mean, for him, it was almost literally heaven sent. And, you know, it's going to be the project of, of his remaining years. And then Reconstruction collapsed, right? It failed, it collapsed. He became a lightning rod for, for opponents of Reconstruction. He was ridiculed in the newspapers. He was hounded by congressional investigations. Uh, and he described himself uh, at the end, uh, 1874, uh, as crippled by the experience. That's his word. And when he was cleared by one last investigation, he immediately rejoined the active duty military and within a week was given command of, of the Department of the Columbia, which was the, the troops in the Northwest. And for him, you no, know, I, Howard really drew me into this project because I found a, a letter when I was researching my first book um, from 1878 that was addressed to Howard in Portland, Oregon. And I thought, how could Howard be in Portland, Oregon? You know, he was from Maine. Uh, he was a fixture of Washington, D.C. during Reconstruction. Uh, to me, you know, almost synonymous with the government project of Reconstruction. How could he be as far away as you can get from Washington uh, and still be in the continental U.S.? And he thought of this as just a, a merciful exile. You know, again, it was God's providence that, that he would be taken out of the snake pit of Reconstruction, and he would be taken to a place where he could do his duty, he'd be back on the winning team working for, for Sherman and Grant again. Uh, and Sherman. Yes. <laughs> and, Go ahead, sorry. And, uh, and actually for him, the, uh, the project of... Uh, putting Native Americans onto reservations, it was almost enacting a fantasy of reconstruction. So early on, he had tried to, uh, uh, with the Freedmen's Bureau, he had hundreds of thousands of confiscated rebel acres that he was thinking about redistributing uh, to the nearly four million freed people in the South. And he kind of, in, he envisioned... That was a Sherman idea. It was initially during the war, it was a Sherman idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and Howard, when in June of 1865, uh, he aggressively tried to distribute all that land as quickly as possible and essentially root African-American citizenship in land ownership. You know, give people their 40 acres and a mule. Uh, and then he, he was a political novice, and he made the, the terrible mistake of uh, issuing this circular and then leaving for Maine for, for the summer uh, so he could spend it uh, with his family who he hadn't seen for most of the war. And when he got back, uh, Andrew Johnson had uh, reversed his order. <laughs> Um, I, I, Go ahead, sorry. I, I've, yeah, sound effects. Right, I live in Tennessee. I, I have a, uh, two young boys, and uh, they've grown up uh, you, you know, taking perverse pride that, that Tennessee was responsible for America's worst president, although now uh, New York is giving <laughs> uh, 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 Andrew Johnson a, a run uh, for his money. Uh, and... Uh, Andrew Johnson reversed the order, uh, and not only uh, was he giving the land back to the, the title owners of, of uh, this property, uh, you know, essentially dooming the freed people to uh, lives as landless hirelings, right, dependent on local labor markets, dependent on former masters, dependent on international markets for cash crops, you know, all, all not good. Uh, he not only did that, but he sent Howard to uh, be the face of this policy. Right? He sent Howard down to the Sea Islands of South Carolina, where he could explain to people who were given their 40 acres uh, that they'd have to give it back. And that was a shattering experience, uh, and, but out in the West, 
Mm -hmm. You could enact this fantasy of reconstruction, right? Uh, he couldn't give away land in the South, but by gum, uh, he could give away small plots of land to Native Americans. He could establish them as yeoman subsistence farmers. And in his view, uh, this would protect them from genocidal wars, and more than that, would send them down a path to equal citizenship. Um, so, you, you know, in a way, uh, you, you know, how could he do it? He had a narrative for himself that, uh, uh, that justified what he was doing. Uh, and then, you know, for a little while, uh, there were plenty of people who, who were amenable to negotiation and moving on to reservations. And he thought, you know, this could be done peacefully. And by doing that, uh, he could find his way back into the good graces of the nation. Mm -hmm. You know, it served him, but he also thought it, it served the various Native American peoples, and he thought it, it you know, ultimately, uh, uh, you know, once they're farmers, they would, you know, quickly embrace Christianity, and he thought it would, it would serve God, too. Just for, just for time reference, um, uh, I'll give you just a little time reference. <clears throat> um, I am the great-grandson of a gentleman by the name of John Wesley Staples, who missed being born a slave by 60 days in Virginia. My uncle, McKinley Staples, died eight years ago at the age of 97. Tall, handsome man, and grew up in a household with former enslaved relatives at the dinner table. So I just give you that reference. Say, this may seem ancient to you, but in my family, it's real. And McKinley, I interviewed him once. You can look it up in the Times. I wrote a column about him. McKinley, I asked him about uh, Sherman. <laughs> Not that he knew him, because he was a child. And, you know, the first thing he said to me, they never gave us our 40 acres. And had they given us our 40 acres, your life would have been different. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm, I'm attracted to these stories because it is also the story of my family, in, uh, which would have been Cherokee territory at the time before they were removed. And so we see... Mr. Howard, right, who comes to his Howard University, the preeminent historically black university in America, bears his name. How did that come to pass? So in late 1866, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a group of politically connected uh, evangelical Congregationalists, the, the first Congregational Church in Washington, D.C., got together to talk about uh, forming a uh, theological school for, for African Americans in Washington, D.C. And it was, uh, I think it was 11 prominent uh, uh, evangelicals. Howard was one of them. And what he said was, you know, theological school is great, and he was someone who was very religious. Theological school would, would appeal to him. Uh, he was a Congregationalist too, or no? Yes. Uh, and uh, he, he integrated the first Congregational Church. And, and he, um, uh, but he said, theological school's not enough. He said, we need a, a full university uh, you know, with uh, a liberal arts program, with a normal college to train teachers, a law school, a medical school. Uh, and uh, he was insistent that they just had to think bigger. And in a way, it was, it was really consistent with uh, his sense of equality. Uh, you know, he was someone, there, there were plenty of abolitionists who mm -hmm. sliced and diced equality into social equality and political equality and, and you know, there were Garrison and the yeah, these different tiers of equality. Howard had a remarkably resilient, unitary sense of equality. And he thought, uh, you, you know, I think of Howard University as not just a monument to reconstruction, but a monument to 
how Reconstruction was under constant threat. You know, Howard knew that the government was only so willing to do things that would really leverage African Americans into equality, like redistribute land. Uh, so he poured his resources into education. And he was a real believer that education was a way, you know, when, when government was, was uh, hamstrung or unwilling uh, to do much, that was a way uh, to, to where, where African Americans could, could rise to equality. You know, the other real way of doing equality on the cheap is voting rights, right, where the, the government then configures itself to serve constituents. Um, but education was one of them. So Howard, he not only said think big, uh, but also poured Bureau resources into forming Howard. And very early on, it was decided it would be named for him. And he said, bad idea. Uh, you, you know, I'm a, a, a controversial figure. You don't want Howard in the crosshairs of opponents of Reconstruction. And what the other people in the room said was, well, if you want, you can pretend we're naming it after some other Howard, but we're naming it Howard. Um, so that, that's the founding of Howard. And he served as its third president. Um, he was really instrumental, not just in getting it started, um, but decades down the line, uh, uh, raising funds, sustaining it. Uh, you, you know, even after the Nez Perce War, he, he was always a, a true believer in Howard and its mission. Mm -hmm. And so we have this gentleman uh, steeped in the experience of freedom fighting, both on the battlefield and after the battlefield for voting rights and education, who is transported to the Northwest, to the Columbia area, with this vision of perhaps a diminished vision that he can somehow solve this dispute amicably? And was he self-deceived? Or what, how, did, how do you see it? I think he wasn't, because it, you know, at the depths of his ordeal of Reconstruction, uh, Ulysses Grant sent him to Arizona as a special envoy to the Chiricahua Apache chief, Cochise. Cochise had waged, waged war on the U.S. for years and years. Uh, Fierce guy. And uh, Howard got to Arizona, and the Army commanders in the area said, there's no way you can convince Cochise to do anything. Uh, you have to just hit him hard with, with troops. And instead, he just took a couple guides, a translator, a couple guides, uh, and uh, you know, essentially just his sidearm. And you know, this small group just rode into Coach's stronghold. And after you know, a few days of talking uh, uh, man to man, um, convinced him to move on to a reservation. And he spent the last years of his life at peace. And so, and that was, you know, after years of being just raked through the coals in the press, uh, he got, you know, his, his first good press in a really long time. And he went out to the Northwest and he had, you know, plenty of success. Mm -hmm. And he thought, you know, I can speak to, to Native Americans. They can tell that I'm a man of feeling, I'm a man of sentiment, uh, I'm a man of sympathy. And they can, uh, they, you know, and they'll listen to, to my arguments. And he had, you know, very good conversations with Joseph uh, in, you know, a year, two years before the war. Uh, and then Little Bighorn happened uh, right around, uh, right before July 4th, 1876. Custis. Yeah. Uh, and... You know, at, at the time, the uh, nation was celebrating its centennial. It was this, this real jolt. Uh, and, you know, for lots of people, you know, Custer's Last Stand, uh, it, you know, is it, it, a lot of Americans at the time. It was, you know, this devastating tragedy. Um, for military people, they take a much less sentimental view. Uh, what it meant was... Uh, there were openings in the officer corps and the cavalry, right? So there were lots of people kind of jockeying for commissions. It was a time when Howard was able to get his son, Guy, uh, a commission in the army. Uh, and, uh, and then Howard saw it as this opportunity 
to engineer his redemption quickly, where within weeks of the, the battle of Little Bighorn, he was in Washington, D.C., and what he said was, the Wallawa Valley in Oregon is going to be the site of the next big Indian war unless we reopen all of the uh, treaty negotiations and you send me out there and I can negotiate with Joseph and convince them to move on to the reservation. And again, for the first time in a long time, Democratic newspapers and Republican newspapers said, Howard's the man for the job. You know, he's, he convinced coaches to move. Uh, he can convince Joseph to move. And there were, I think, talking points that he kind of planted uh, that were reprinted, saying, uh, it, you know, after years of being uh, uh, accused of all manner of financial mismanagement during Reconstruction, they said not only is he going to avoid this national trauma of a, a big Indian war, um, but he's also going to save the taxpayers tens of millions of dollars that it would cost to have a big Indian war. Uh, and the Secretary of the Interior, civilian uh, officials, reopened the matter, composed a new commission with Howard as, as a central member, uh, and sent them uh, to negotiate with Joseph. And all he had to do was agree to move on to the reservation. And he had this good press. There's all this expectation. Uh, and he got to the Northwest. And the first thing Joseph did was make them wait a few days. And then... I, I would have. Oh, and, <laughs> and then when Joseph came, uh, uh, he, he said he listened to, to Howard's pitch and said, not only uh, no way are we moving, you know, the, the treaty rights are, are ours. You know, we, we didn't sign on to the 1863 treaty. Um, and we want our land more than anything. We value our land. Um, but he also disputed the idea that this commission would have the final word on the subject. And in a way, it, it was, you know, Four years after he started advocating for his land with the federal government, you know, he had this sense of how federal government, the, the power was scattered you know, over you know, all manner of people. You know, it's federal, state, local government, it's legislative, executive, judicial branches, it's civilian, military authorities, and then it's also all these agencies and all these bureaucrats whose bailiwicks overlapped and who competed with each other all the time. So Howard, he, he, Joseph, his sense was you could argue something and you could lose, but there's always someone else to turn to. And often just persisting in making your point, you know, to one forum after another, that could be leveraged into rights. That's so like, a, that's like a, the Frederick Douglass model. I mean, it's, and it's a model that I think uh, you know, as everybody wonders, uh, uh, you know, what can we do today? Is, you know, marching in a march worth anything? Is calling a congressman worth anything? You know, Joseph's view was everything is worth something uh, because power is split in so many ways. You just have to keep pushing on every point and eventually you'll find a soft point. And so Joseph stood and looked Howard in the eye and said, uh, not only do we not want to give up our land, but I don't agree that you're the final word on this. You know, I think that uh, we can keep negotiating this. And Howard saw his redemption just slip through the fingers of, of his left hand. Uh, and, he, and at that point, you know, he, he, you know, Joseph was speaking in these compelling ways, and there are other members of the commission who were saying, you know, Joseph is, is speaking from his heart, and he's speaking in a very genuine way. And then Howard, this man of feeling, this man of sympathy, uh, someone who, you know, couldn't get through a church service without crying. You know, he turned ice cold, and, you know, these, these transcripts survive. Hmm. Uh, and... And you see 
Joseph kind of beginning to get a little traction with the other members of the commission, and then Howard just dumps cold water on it, and he says things like, uh, well, Joseph, if, if this is the, the position you're taking, then, uh, you, you know, I don't know what to say when, when evil happens to you. They're just, just you know, chilling. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it's this moment where I feel like Joseph uh, understood how government works and how dissent and protest works in this, you know, new America of, you know, regulation and administration and bureaucracy. And Howard just didn't quite get it in the same way. Mm -hmm. Just a brief location question. How different was the land of the Nez Perce from where they were headed? So the, the reservation that Howard was trying to uh, negotiate them onto was 100 miles from the Wallawa Valley mm -hmm. uh, in north central Idaho. And in many ways, it's uh, similar territory. I mean, it's, it's um, a country where uh, rolling prairie kind of breaks off into incredibly deep canyons. You know, and it, what's amazing it, when you go there uh, is, you know, the Wallawa Valley uh, is ringed by mountains on all sides, pretty tall mountains, but they're in the distance, and the prairies just kind of roll on, and you can imagine them rolling on for just miles and miles and miles. And then it's like you take three steps to the right, you know, off the trail, and the earth just breaks away into a canyon deeper than the Grand Canyon, Hell's Canyon. And you look out onto Hell's Canyon, and you think, well, this has to be the boundary of, of you know, Joseph's people, right? It, it has to, how can anyone get in? How can anyone right. get out? And then you realize that Nez Perce country extends for another 100 miles to the east. And, you know, you get the sense, you know, when you stay at a hotel with a view of the mountains, right, or if you're, you're looking at a scenic vista, you see these mountains and you think, you know, mountains are this miracle, right? They're the sublime. And, you know, flat land, this is our everyday life. But I think it's kind of reversed for, for Joseph's people that um, uh, mountains were every day. Every day, they're, they're climbing down into canyons with the seasons. They're climbing up. Uh, they send children out into the mountains for, for their initiations. You know, people climb over mountains all the time. And the real miracle is flat land. Right, where you can convene, you can prosper, you can find you know, safety and plenty. And it, you know, for it, the, the reservation where they were moving, you know, in many ways it was similar, um, although at the same time it was populated by the Nez Perce bands who had signed the treaty in 1863 that had given away their land. And these were people who were, um, had, had converted to, to Presbyterianism uh, uh, decades before, who had embraced the life uh, of farming small plots. And Joseph's people on the Wallawa Valley... Had many of the Cherokee before they were moved. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and Joseph's people on the Wallawa Valley, they were... Uh, they subscribed to um, uh, dreamer religions of, of the Columbia Plateau, uh, and they were herdsmen. And I think one thing that Howard really didn't understand was that they were rich. You know, they had herds, horses, cattle, thousands of head. And as they were uh, running from the army during the Nez Perce War, uh, often they would bury caches of objects that were too heavy for them to carry. And when the soldiers came through and just dug it right up, looted it, what they found were silver place settings. They were finding China from, from trade with the Hudson Bay Company. You know, they were living so much better than the soldiers. And as they went through, you know, they, they did the strategic retreat over about 14, 1,500 miles of... Before you go, before you go, let's yep. just set the stage for a moment. Because 
We have Howard, the idealist, turned utilitarian, betrays his values. I'm doing the movie script. <laughs> and we have the notebook, because in this film, really, the star of this film is Joseph. Tragic star, but the star nonetheless. So, so we're standing in the room, and Howard, of the remaining left hand, is threatening Joseph. Right? And I wonder what Joseph's thinking. Uh, part, of, part of it, I'll tell you what Joseph's thinking. <laughs> He's thinking, I'm a diplomat, but if you push it, I'm ready to die right here. That's what he was thinking. So how do we get our war? What happens? So in the spring of 1877, um, Howard issued an ultimatum where he essentially gave Joseph's band and other bands that were living traditional lives outside the reservation 30 days to come onto the reservation, round up their herds, move on to the reservation, move on to this life of relative poverty as, as farmers on small plots of land. Let's not forget disease. And it was at a time when the Snake River that ran through Hell's Canyon and the Salmon River were at flood stage. And to understand, you know, it would mean they would have to round up thousands of head of horses of cattle, go down into a canyon deeper than the Grand Canyon, cross the Snake River at flood stage, which is an enormous river. And at flood stage, it's just roaring. And then go over another set of mountains, cross the Salmon River, which when Howard had to cross it during the war, he described it as a torrent with mountain shores. And then climb up onto uh, uh, the Camas Prairie and go onto the reservation. And they made it. But by the time they got to the boundary of the reservation, they'd lost hundreds of head of cattle and seen uh, uh, settlers rounding them up and just taking them. Uh, and they were exhausted. They were traumatized by having to leave their beloved valley. And what happened was, they, you know, in, in many ways, decision-making among uh, these bands was very egalitarian. You know, there were lots of leaders, lots of people who could claim leadership. And then even after issues were kind of hashed out, people could follow their own conscience. And there were three young warriors who decided that they would settle a few scores among the settlers who had settled along the Salmon River. And they would engage in some revenge killings. And so the night before the ultimatum deadline, uh, there were these killings along the Salmon River. And once that happened, uh, you, you know, there was a moment where the young warriors were deeply suspicious of Joseph and they thought that he would just take his band and move on to the reservation and surrender. Um, but the, the bands kind of moved together. Uh, they, they kind of panicked and moved to an old traditional campsite. And a uh, cavalry detachment uh, went to, to with them, uh, went after them. And as they came down this long canyon, you know, Nez, Nez Perce uh, warriors were watching them as they came down, uh, there was a peace delegation, you know, even at that late moment, where they came flying a white flag uh, and they were shot at. And as soon as that happened, I mean, there was no turning back. Uh, you know, for one thing, uh, while the cavalry recruits, um, they were not allowed really to target practice with live ammunition. Uh, so they had never really shot guns. Because there was too little of it. They were not given repeater rifles because it was thought the instant they got into battle, they would just shoot away all their ammunition. Uh, and they were trying to fire from horses. Which you know, is really hard. Right. I, you know, I, I learned how to ride a horse for this book. and, and uh, It's it, hard. Yes. I, I rode a horse like a, a Brooklyn cab driver. I had, you know, one, one hand on the horn. Uh, and uh, so the soldiers would fire and hit nobody. 
Uh, and uh, you know, the Nez Perce warriors could, knew how to fire rifles. Uh, and so in that first encounter, uh, a third of the cavalry was killed. Uh, and the, you know, the, the cavalry tactics were to ride to the bottom of a deep canyon to meet the Nez Perce bands. And so then they had to retreat uphill. And again, you know, seeing Nez Perce country, you kind of appreciate how the warriors actually were much better at going uphill because they went uphill all the time. Uh, and so after that, uh, war was on. There was no turning back. Wow. And how would, do we reckon how many people died and how long this went on? Yeah, so there is a, um, it, there are, certainly the army counts are, are accurate and, and of, of their own casualties. Uh, and, you know, my, my guess is, you know, I don't remember the precise numbers, but, you know, I would say low hundreds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's a lot of people at that time. Yeah, but you know, not a, not a uh, an enormous number like we see in modern warfare. Mm -hmm. um, and the Nez Perce families, um, uh, you know, they, the early battles there are very few who are killed, uh, and then there is one ambush and massacre where uh, an army detachment uh, uh, in the dead of night. Uh, reached where the Nez Perce were camping, and as the sun was rising, they just shot into the teepees. Uh, and they, uh, you know, likely killed, uh, you know, more than 100 uh, women, children, babies, elderly people, I mean, just everybody. Um, and then, uh, you know, there were, uh, I would say, a few dozen more uh, killed in the final battles. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, the, uh, you know, Joseph's band, uh, I think, lost uh, easily as many people, if not more, uh, when they were exiled to Indian territory mm -hmm. uh, after the war. They were there for eight years. And there, they died of malaria and dysentery and cholera and had almost 100% infant mortality. Uh, tuberculosis, pneumonia, people were killing themselves, so they were depressed. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was uh, easily as bad. What does, what does Joseph, do we have much of Joseph's oratory at this point? Do we know what, he, what he's saying? And he decides finally that this, bat, this fight is, too, is futile. What does he say? Yeah, so, uh, so Joseph wasn't the war chief. Um, although he was so front and center in the negotiations before the war that every battlefield victory and every setback that the army had was immediately attributed to Joseph's brilliance. So, you know, during the war, there was this legend of Joseph where he was Achilles, he was Odysseus, he was Hannibal, he was Napoleon. Um, but after the war... Too big for Napoleon. <laughs> and he, in the final battle... Many of the war chiefs died, and Joseph was one of the few left. And there was one major Nez Perce leader, White Bird, who escaped with about 100 people to, to Canada. Uh, but there were uh, women and children, elderly people who couldn't escape, and Joseph stayed with them. And so he was the leader who was left. And, and you know, once they were besieged, they sort of fought the army to a stalemate. Once they were besieged, it was a question of negotiation again. And who is a better negotiator than Joseph? Nobody. Uh, and so he gave a surrender statement that very soon afterwards, Howard's lieutenant and then Howard himself uh, uh, you know, released to the press and uh, included in uh, the official report to the Secretary of War, uh, where Joseph famously said, um, uh, from where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. And almost... Say, repeat that, please. Just, just repeat that. Right, so from where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. And immediately, 
this was a sensation. And it wound up being one of the most recited speeches in American schools. And Joseph's people, they were marched from, they got within 40 miles of the Canadian border, so they were in northern Montana when they were captured. And they were marched to Bismarck, Dakota Territory. And by the time they got to Bismarck, people were lining the way in Bismarck, uh, plying the Nez Perce families with food, and they were all trying to get a, a glimpse of the great man. And when they were exiled, uh, they were, at the surrender, one thing that Joseph negotiated for was return to the Nez Perce reservation. And Howard agreed to that, and, and Nelson Miles, who, who uh, led the final troop that surrounded Joseph, agreed to that. Um, but Sherman, who had envisioned, <laughs> who had envisioned Joseph uh, uh, you know, dangling from a rope at the end of this war, he said, no way. Uh, Sherman and Sheridan kind of reversed that uh, and, and vacated that promise. And instead, they were imprisoned for the winter at Fort Leavenworth uh, and then sent into Indian Territory in Oklahoma. And, you know, for, uh, and once they were in exile, uh, people were, thousands of people visited him at Fort Leavenworth, thousands of people came out to Indian Territory to, to see him, and he was invited to Washington, and he uh, gave a, a big speech in Washington that, that filled an auditorium, and that wound up uh, being published and really widely distributed, and you know it was published, and then people would render his words as verse, uh, and you know his oratory from for the next 25 years until his death, uh, he was someone who. Uh, made repeated visits to the East Coast, uh, to, to Washington, D.C., to, uh, to New York. He was um, uh, in the uh, parade to dedicate Grant's tomb, time when everyone knew who was buried in Grant's tomb, uh, and uh, was uh, an honored guest. I think the spotlight kind of shone on him uh, at Buffalo Bill's Wild West show at Madison Square Garden. Uh, and you, but people would turn out uh, for, for his speeches in D.C., in New York, in uh, Seattle. And then at the very end of his life, uh, uh, he actually had a reunion with, with Howard uh, at the graduation ceremony for, for the Carlisle Indian Training School in Pennsylvania. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Howard, who had been very prickly and defensive about his conduct in the Nez Perce War, because I think he kind of knew, really at the moment of surrender, that he was no longer the hero of his own story. It was kind of a hard thing for, for someone who believed that God had put him on earth for a reason. Uh, he, you know, Howard, uh, he was supposed to speak to the graduates, but basically only spoke to Joseph. And then Joseph took the podium. Can't you see this movie script? <laughs> and Joseph took the podium, and he's one of the few people who uh, wasn't uh, being punished for speaking his native language right at the Carlisle Indian School. It was uh, uh, its headmaster, it was his last, uh, Richard Henry Pratt, it was his last commencement ceremony. It was, was a very punitive place. He was someone who, his, he said his goal in life was to kill the Indian and save the man, right? So people were, the children, their heads were shorn. Uh, they were punished for speaking their native languages. They were wearing military uniforms. It must have been a terrifying sight for Joseph. Uh, but Joseph looked out at this horrifying scene uh, and looked at Howard and forgave Howard. And... He, you know, Howard, who had been so defensive for so long, uh, I mean, clearly it, it, it melted him. Uh, and, you know, thinking about why would Joseph do that? Right? Why would Joseph say that? Uh, and that was kind of a puzzle to me. And, that, and as I was going through the archives, right, what I wound up finding afterwards was <clears throat> letters from Howard and letters from Richard Henry Pratt to various Congress people urging them 
uh, to give uh, lots of money uh, to Joseph's band. And you could see even then uh, he was, you know, kind of working the room uh, and always advocating. You know, he, he achieved this measure of celebrity, mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't seem to enjoy it very much. People would occasionally say, you know, is Joseph enjoying himself too much? And from every indication, he was just really focused on not just trying to get reparations for his people, but really trying to reopen the question of whether the Wallawa Valley, uh, uh, whether his people could get land in their homeland. Uh, and what's amazing, you know, he had this sense that you could always reopen every question. And to the end of his life, the govern you know, you would think not just an 1863 treaty, but a war would resolve the land claim question. But this Interior Department kept reopening it and kept opening, you know, reopening the, this question of whether there could be land set aside in the Wallawa Valley. You know, they kept doing that. Never quite got there. But he always knew, uh, you know, this was, this was something that he could do. And all the way to the end, you know, in, in front of Howard, I think he, he still, he, you know, had that focus. Well, you know, I would, you know, you know more about him than I do, but you, one gets a sense of Joseph that he, he understood the forces of modernity that, you know, we only begin to understand many, many years later. I mean, the Iron Horse by that point, and the travel by that point, and the entertainment by that point, he saw that Native Americans have been turned into entertainment. Uh, but he also, what might he think if I was writing the motivation for Joseph? Mm -hmm in that forgiveness speech. Um, he saw by that point, I would hazard, that Howard was as much a prisoner of circumstances as he. He did see that. And at least that's how I would write it mm -hmm. in, in the film. Uh, but how does Joseph die? And where does he die? So Joseph's people were exiled after the war, Indian Territory. And he actually wrote Howard saying, we're desperate, we're dying, this is hell. Uh, can you help us get to the Northwest again? And Howard wrote back and said, you live in the Indian Territory now. I, su I suggest you make the best of it. But he kept pushing. Actually, Nelson Miles, this other, other officer, uh, really championed his, his cause, as well as the, the general who commanded the forces that massacred women and children at, at the Battle of the Big Hole. And all these people advocated for his return, and uh, this perpetual exile only lasted eight years. And they were allowed back uh, to the Northwest, and the people in his band and, and the other bands who had survived the war, who had embraced Christianity in exile, uh, they were allowed to uh, uh, go back to the Nez Perce Reservation in Idaho. Uh, but Joseph and uh, 100 plus uh, uh, members of his band, they kept going and uh, they went to the Colville Indian Reservation uh, which is in north central Washington, um, where the, uh, right where the Grand Coulee Dam is. And I, you know, in the months before his death in 1904, uh, he had gone to Washington, and that's where he met, he went to Carlisle and saw Howard. And then he had actually gone to St. Louis. Uh, for a, a, a um, exposition, where I think, I think um, uh, you, you know there were uh, all kinds of other chiefs who were there too. Uh, you, you know there were you, you know if if those walls could talk, uh, be I, I, I'm very curious about his time in St. Louis. And then he went home, uh, and you know in. Um, uh, in the fall of uh, 1904, uh, you know, his people, they 
could hunt and fish and, and had small herds uh, and would slaughter government cattle on the Colville Reservation. Uh, but another way they, they kind of supported themselves was in late summer into the fall, uh, they would be migrant hops pickers in the Yakima Valley. And while many of his people were, were picking hops, he stayed behind. Uh, and he had a heart attack alone in his teepee. And, he, you know, his he, people for much of his life from the time he was 30 onward uh, would just pile you know, these, these uh, you know, romantic uh, projections onto Joseph. And all the way to the very end, when, when the reservation doctor said, Joseph died of a broken heart. But all the way to the end, you know, even as many of the answers uh, that he was getting were, were very discouraging and depressing, depressing you know, I think he realized that to have rights in America, you just had to commit to fighting for them all the time. Right? You fight for them through victory, and you fight for them through defeat. And to the end, he, he was fighting. We'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> now we'll take a few questions, and we'll take also um, resumes for script writing on the film. <laughs> that's, one, that's the first question there. I would like to know whether General Howard embraced um, the establishment of reservations um, and providing some land to individuals, although um, Native Americans did not know land ownership, individual ownership. It is all owned by the entire tribe or by people. There was no, this concept of individual ownership did not exist. So how did, if, if Howard did not embrace in the depth of his soul this system, how could he go to the Northwest and perpetuate the system? So I think he embraced it. You know, he was a believer in what was known as Grant's peace policy. And he, the way he explained it was, he, he said, you know, he was born in 1830 in, in Maine. He said, you know, I grew up with uh, old men who had grown up hearing stories from old men uh, about uh, the, the Indians who had lived among us in Maine. And the way they spoke, uh, you, you know, the only thing to do was, was to kill them all. And he said, I never believed that. Uh, and I, I you know, dearly believe that they, sh they were entitled to life. Uh, and, but what he thought was there were, there were two possibilities. Right? There was uh, extermination. extermination or assimilation. Right? And he thought the reservation policy uh, again, you, you know, it's this fantasy of reconstruction. It was uh, distributing land. It was also access, the peace policy was access to lots of social services. And it was also lots of religious services. And, you, you know, the, part of the peace policy was uh, the, the staffing of the reservation agents and other people. A lot of it was done with consultation uh, with um, missionaries and churches. Uh, so, you know, one of the first missionaries to the Nez Perce were, was uh, Henry Spaulding, a Presbyterian. Uh, so John Monteith, who is, who is the uh, reservation agent, was someone who was kind of handpicked by the Presbyterian church. His dad was a missionary and, and sort of pastored the, the church there. Um, Howard believed it. Uh, I think he, and he believed in peace, and he believed that Native Americans were capable of, of equal citizenship, and, but in this very particular way. 
right? And with Howard, you really see the line between, uh, you really see how sympathy is not the same as empathy. Yes, yes. Next question, we got one here. Were there major changes in Native American relocation policy before and after the Civil War? And if so, what were they? So that's a great question. Um, I think the, the big development you know, during the Civil War provision was made for transcontinental railroads. And as the transcontinentals were built uh, and built through Native American land, uh, the long-standing process uh, or lo long-standing practice of making treaties with Native Americans changed, uh, and the uh, you know, the the so initially it was to allow railroads through, but but really it was uh, you know the the railroads meant uh, at the end of the great bison herds. It it, it and very quickly the government sort of gave up uh, uh, the practice of uh, making treaties with Native American tribes as sovereign nations uh, and instead sort of subjecting them to you know, the full might of, of federal power. You know, they, we think of um, you know, citizenship as kind of mediated through the states for most, most Americans, but you know, with freed people, uh, with Native Americans, these were kind of the first citizens of, or first subjects of the modern American state. Uh, so there were these changes that were happening. Uh, the, the peace policy kind of grew out of that. Uh, and, but then, you know, by the late 1880s, um, that's when uh, collective ownership and, and sort of reservation policy uh, with a treaty, without a treaty, um, sort of gave way to a, the allotment era where individual Native Americans were given fee simple allotments, you know, ownership, individual ownership of their own plots of land. Oklahoma. And, and it was an enormous land grab because they would distribute these small plots. They didn't just divide up the whole reservation by the number of Native Americans. They would just give these small plots to Native Americans and then whatever was left over would just go on the market. And then once Native Americans had fee simple land, they could sell it. And that's why in many reservations all over the West, they, you know, if you look at patterns of ownership, they, they have what, what's known as uh, a checkerboard character, right, where there are plots of land owned by Native Americans and then interspersed through all of it are plots of land owned, owned by whites. Um, so, the, you know, there was a, a tremendous change over, you know, in this period, you know, really between 1863 and, uh, 1889 into, into the 1890s. Yeah, it's, very fast, it's a fascinating period to look at in Oklahoma uh, when Oklahoma was verging on statehood that they essentially dissolve the, res they dissolve the Indian Territory reservations in this very way. Uh, and uh, it had the Native Americans, um, and many of whom, uh, all the five civilized tribes in Oklahoma, by the way, uh, owned enslaved people. And in... Uh, you know, the black Indians also got land, but um, they had the misfortune of having oil in Oklahoma. And so talk about a land grab and swindling, and there's still a story to be done based on legal documents there about how much land disappeared out from under people, um, and very, very quickly, uh, too. But any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, the Wawa Valley is a pretty small patch of arable land, really, all things considered. Um, was there anything driving the U.S. government to, you know, I mean, in its way, it would have been a perfect place to let the Nez Perce, you know, live uh, relatively peaceably. Uh, you know, it, it's so isolated, doesn't sustain too many people even today. What was driving the government to drive people from even this small relative island in the middle of nowhere? So when you read 
the reports that Indian agents wrote to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, they would talk about uh, the Native Americans, uh, how well they were assimilating, but then they would mention the settlers. And the settlers were just hungry for land. And one valley west of the Wallao Valley, the Grand Ron Valley, was settled in the 1860s. And you know, it was, um, uh, you know, it's like the musical Oklahoma, the, the, the prairie grass was as high as an elephant's eye. Entire herds could get lost in the prairie grass. And, uh, but then, you know, pretty quickly that got settled uh, and it was uh, turned into farms, it was turned into ranch lands. Uh, and then people started thinking about the Wallawa country. And you, know, you cross the mountains, and they're very steep, uh, and you look out, and what they saw looked like the Grand Ron Valley from 10 years earlier. And so people started, you, you know, the, the, the treaty in 1863 that ceded the Wallawa Valley that Joseph Spann wasn't really a party to, um, it was brought about by uh, gold being discovered in Nez Perce country in Idaho. And so that was 1861. And within a year, uh, white prospectors outnumbered Nez Perce people in Idaho, Nez Perce country by two to one. And it was a complete catastrophe. You know, it, was, uh, it meant you know, murders, it meant liquor, it meant uh, land, um, uh, you know, fertile prairie being you know, eaten down, down to the roots. Uh, it was just a complete and total catastrophe. And the response of Congress was uh, to say, all these prospectors are awful, they're breaking the law, but we're just gonna have to, you know, we can't in the middle of the Civil War, uh, you know, kick, use armed forces to kick these people off this land. So instead we're gonna shrink the Nez Perce Treaty lands by 90% and create this tiny kernel of land that uh, we can police a little better. And so on one hand, what was happening in Idaho, away from the Wallawa Valley, kind of sealed the Wallawa Valley's fate. But then settlers started coming in, in the 1870s, and once they were in, uh, you know, there's this sense that you can't go back. You know, if a band can opt out of a treaty, and if land can be moved from the public domain back to a nomadic Native American tribe, then the whole root of how Western land was owned uh, would be called into question, right? Bands would peel off from, from treaties, uh, and really as long as there were people, this was something that Indian agents were, were adamant about, as long as there was anyone leading a traditional life, you know, worshiping traditional religions, then they would have a hard time getting anyone to accept life on a reservation because it was just so much better. So there were all these forces and uh, you know, none of them were, were good ones. One more question, anyone? Yes, ma'am? One more and then you in the blue jacket. Well, after her. Yes. I wondered what happened to Howard after the war? You, you told us what happened to, to, to Chief Joseph, but your other character. Yeah, so, so Howard, after the war, had a typical career for an army officer. So he was moved to different departments. So he did his tour in, in the Department of the Columbia. Then he was brought to, to be commandant of West Point, uh, where he, part of the reason he was brought in was to give cover to a court martial of one of the first black cadets uh, and, and kind of negotiate a settlement where uh, the, the uh, Which one? Uh, Flipper? No. Flipper? Uh, no, no. no. Um, uh, it was um, uh, Whitaker um, uh, and 
uh, he, he went through four years of West Point, and right before his final exams, he was found bound and beaten, and then was court-martialed for binding and beating himself. <laughs> and Howard kind of negotiated this quiet uh, parting of ways. Uh, and, and then after that, he was sent to the Department of the Platte in Omaha, then to Governor's Island here in New York, and then he reached retirement age and went on the retired list. Now, all the while, you know, he grumbled about not getting promoted to major general quickly enough. Uh, Nez Perce war partly to blame. Uh, and he said, you know, he, that he was adamant that he was in the right in the Nez Perce war, but then he couldn't stop writing about it. So he, right after the war, he wrote a big book on Joseph called Nez Perce Joseph. And then Joseph figured in multiple other books, you know, substantial chapters devoted to the Nez Perce War. Uh, so he couldn't stop writing about Joseph. And then he, uh, you know, he wrote all kinds of other things too. Uh, and in retirement, uh, he, he tried to rejoin the army when he, uh, when the Spanish American War broke out, uh, but. He was old, he had this kind of up and down career as an officer, and instead he wound up uh, evangelizing among the soldiers and sailors who were getting ready to go to Cuba. Uh, he, you know, save them from bars and brothels. And he wrote about that. And then, he, you know, what he found was in old age, he was one of the longest surviving Civil War generals and became this kind of beloved figure of nostalgia. Theodore Roosevelt said, uh, you know, he's the officer we like to honor most. And he kept fundraising for Howard, and he opened a, um, uh, founded a university for uh, poor Appalachian youth uh, uh, called Lincoln, Lincoln Memorial uh, uh, in Tennessee, my home state. And, uh, and he lived uh, uh, until 1909, uh, and, you know, it was a very, uh, it, you know, his death really says a lot about his life in retirement, where basically he uh, heard uh, singers from Tuskegee. He requested that they sing his, his favorite song, Swing Low. Uh, he went and gave a lecture on his experience at the Battle of Gettysburg. And then he, uh, uh, when he got home, he had a heart attack and died. One more question. Thanks. Uh, that uh, incident, there's a book on that assault on West, at West Point, right. and mm -hmm. um, they did a movie with it, Sam, I think Sam, uh, guy from Law and Order, uh, and uh, Samuel Jackson started it. It's mm -hmm. the only movie I've seen Samuel Jackson not cursing. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Um, my questions uh, were two, very quick question, twofold. Number one, uh, Given that there's only been two film renditions that I'm aware of, I Will Fight No More Forever and Kim Burns, The West, mm -hmm. uh, has Chief Joseph gotten his due? Would you say that he is in the pantheon with Cochise and Tecumseh and Red Cloud? And uh, the second question is, what is the status of the Nest Purse now? Uh, did uh, you had mentioned that they had, some of them had resettled back in the Northwest, but mm -hmm. as a group, as a people, as individuals, how are they doing now? So all good questions. So, you know, Joseph was a, uh, a significant subject of, of fascination uh, in American popular culture. You know, it wasn't just uh, recitations of his speech. Although, uh, yeah, I guess for a Brooklyn crowd, um, if you watch uh, Wes Anderson's movie Moonrise Kingdom, uh, there's a moment when um, uh, the, uh, the lead scout is being chased by everybody else, and he stops and, and says, I will fight no more forever. Um, so you can see it kind of rippling a little bit, although he, you know, I, I think he was much more in circulation 40, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, and uh, you know, Robert Penn Warren wrote uh, an endless poem about Chief Joseph. Uh, he, the, the Chief Joseph pattern uh, is a popular Pendleton blanket. Uh, and you can certainly find uh, no end of 
posters and mouse pads with Chief Joseph on Amazon. There's a stamp of Chief Joseph. Um, you know, is there uh, enough? I think no, and I think actually uh, what's really not a part of, you know, Chief Joseph is someone who, uh, his words really survive, uh, and his oratory survives, and, and his, you know, the content of it, it's a plea for rights that is very, very modern if you read it. Uh, you know, what liberty means, what equality means. Um, but at the same time, I think what's, what's less understood is the way his plea for liberty and equality is a plea for liberty and equality in an age of big government. You know, how we speak to power, how we get heard. And I think it's not just his message, but it's also his method that I think is incredibly important for us to, to have in mind today. Okay, we're gonna, my friend is gonna sign some books for you, and thank you for coming. <laughs>